Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this webinar on the theme of how to evaluate a culture media in the real world. I'm Emily Austin, Managing Director of Cooper Surgical Fertility UK in Ireland, and it's a pleasure to have you join us today. So we're going to start today with a couple of short presentations and then we will ask our panel of guest speakers to recount their experiences of evaluating a culture media. Practically, how did they decide to undertake this and how did they decide whether or not the evaluation was a success and something they'd like to continue with? I'll introduce our panel members as we get to them, but to get us going, we've got a duo of Steve's today, Dr. Steve Troop and Dr. Steve Levitt. Dr. Steve Troop has nearly 35 years experience in the field of fertility and a PhD in male infertility. Steve has risen through the ranks to have been the scientific director of Liverpool Women's Hospital Hewitt Fertility Centres and more recently IVI's UK centres, as well as his day-to-day -day operational, managerial and research responsibilities in both NHS and private sectors. Steve has often provided advice to regulatory bodies, educators, the commercial sector and colleagues around the world. He's particularly proud to have been both chair and president of the Association of Clinical Embryologists and a founder member of the newly formed Association of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists. Steve now works independently as a consultant reproductive scientist based in the UK. Dr. Steve Levitt has worked in embryology in the public and private sector since the early 90s in the UK, Canada, Nigeria, Sri Lanka and Kuwait. Steve joined Wallace in 2006 and became Global Business Director in 2010 and also worked as National Sales Manager for Faring UK before joining Life Global as VP International Sales. Since 2018, Steve has worked as Director of Clinical Applications at Cooper Surgical Fertility Solutions, supporting IVF clinics in optimising culture systems and introducing new products and protocols, including today's subject of culture media. We have a few international delegates today, which is wonderful. You are most very welcome to join us from wherever you may be based around the world. We and our panel members are based in the UK and Ireland, so any references we do make to regulation will have the UK and Ireland in mind. If you have questions during the presentations and whilst the panel are discussing their experiences, please enter them into the Q&A box. We have 60 minutes to date, so there'll be plenty of time at the end to answer your questions, so please do put them through. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, Steve Troop, I'll now hand over to you. Thank you. Great, thanks very much indeed, Emily, for the kind invitation to, to um, take part in this webinar. Um, just before we kick off with a bit of an introduction from me, let's take a look at the results of the poll which are on the, uh, on the screen now and thanks to, the, um, uh, to the, the, the individuals that have filled this in. Um, we can see that overwhelmingly um, people are, are now using single step medium and that's, that's perhaps not surprising. Um, most people seem to have used their culture media for a relatively long period of time, by which I mean probably, um, well, as, the, as indicated on here, for, for between um, zero and five years. Um, although there is one, one uh, participant there that's used the same culture media system for, for over 10 years, which is interesting. Um, what's the most important factor uh, when choosing culture media? And again, I, I think these, this is not a surprising response, is that the, most people are concerned about how, um, how good their outcomes are with, with the particular culture media. And um, interestingly, uh, seven out of the 10 people that have responded here um, are thinking of changing culture media. And it'll be interesting, I think, to explore um, the reasons why that might be the case. Um, just to take a quick snapshot of that. Um, yeah, there are, there are factors which are stopping people evaluating culture media. Um, it's interesting that people think it might take a long time. Um, and, uh, and cost, of course, is an issue together with one respondent there mentioning that resources are, uh, are, might be a problem. So I think these are interesting and I, and I think these are exactly the sorts of topics that we'll be able to discuss with the panel a bit later on. But just before we do that, let's um, just allow me to give a quick introduction. Um, so the, the decision to change culture media, or at least take a look at a new one, isn't an easy one. Um, and I guess this is because it's such a fundamental part, of, such a fundamental component of the, of the IVF lab. Um, more often than uh, not, the lab will have used the same culture media um, for quite some time. And we could see that from the, uh, um, you know, from the results of the poll there. 
um, on people of using culture media often for many years. And the, the notion of changing culture media, particularly when things are going well, is understandably counterintuitive. Um, although I might argue that changing culture media when things are going well um, is exactly when it should be done rather than in response to you know, falling outcomes or, or, or other problems. Um, but again, from the poll, perhaps the most important consideration is that of clinical efficacy. In other words, will the outcomes be better, the same, or perhaps even worse with a new culture media? I'll, I'll come back to this a little later. Cost, of course, is an important driver in this decision. I think culture media is probably the single most um, expensive part of the whole process. Um, but there are many other considerations um, for example, supply, particularly at the moment, you know, is the, is the supply chain robust? Um, the, the shelf life, uh, the, the way that this allows you to, to manage your stock, packaging. Um, I know that people have concerns at the moment with, with the way in which some suppliers, um, you know, send culture media in enormous boxes. Um, support, how easy is it to get hold of the account manager? And um, I think not to be underestimated is what other labs are doing, um, you know, what your friends and colleagues around, around the country are, are saying. But um, let's just look at evaluating clinical efficacy a little bit closer, because I think this does um, pose a problem. It, it's tempting, of course, to try to set up some sort of trial within your lab um, to show that the new culture media is at least as good as the old culture media. But it is extremely difficult to statistically prove equivalence. equivalence. In other words, it's, it's, it is, in fact, almost impossible to statistically show that something is exactly the same as, um, uh, as something else. And this slide shows how many patients would be required to perform a trial to show a, a statistically significant improvement in pregnancy rate. Um, comparing media A with media B. So it's two culture media and the outcome is whether, whether the patient got pregnant or not. And even if your expected uplift was as large as 10%, for example, from 35 to 45%, as you can see from the slide, you'd still need around 500 patients in each arm of the study. And of course, the smaller the uplift you're trying to show, the larger N has to be. So I guess the reality is that to do this type of trial properly is, is beyond the capability of most centres, simply due to the number of patients that would be required. But crucially, um, whilst it might not be possible to conduct this type of trial in, in a sort of conventional sense, it most certainly is possible and essential really um, to undertake a, a useful and meaningful evaluation of new culture media before introducing it into your lab. Um, and Steve Levitt will, um, will, will provide some tips and tricks on how to do this in a moment. Um, I'd just like to leave you with a, a small word of caution. Um, and that's in relation to research governance. Um, regulation does exist, certainly in the UK, um, regarding the performance of, uh, of research. Uh, and um, however, in my opinion, the type of media evaluation that we're talking about today um, does not constitute research in the conventional sense and shouldn't therefore require external approval. Um, however, I, I must say that in my experience, the way in which research governance is, is applied does vary between institutions. So I'd recommend that that before you do a media evaluation, you do seek advice locally before embarking um, on a media evaluation, just to make sure that you're not falling foul of, um, of local rules. Um, and I know this, this is a bit of an issue that, that worries people, and we can perhaps come back to this in the discussion at the end. Um, so I'll hand over to Steve Levitt now to, to share his thoughts on, on how to meaningfully uh, evaluate a new culture media in, in your lab. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks, uh, Steve, for uh, for that introduction. And um, I just want to um, cover briefly some of the uh, practical considerations that uh, 
that you should have uh, before you embark on a, a, a media evaluation. And I don't want to take up too uh, much time because obviously we want to listen to our uh, three guest uh, speakers who have um, gone through this process uh, and are going to share their experiences uh, uh, with us. So uh, if I can get the slides to, to move forward. So of course, as, uh, as Steve mentioned, that uh, the culture media part of a, a culture a system within your lab um, is absolutely critical to um, uh, a, a, an outcome that we want for uh, for our patients. And so optimizing that uh, culture system is very important. And uh, certainly over the last uh, few months in the uh, in the pandemic, we've covered in, in many areas uh, the quality control and and some of those uh, webinars are, are available on the on the Cooper Surgical website. So if you're interested in that side of things, please go and have a look. But one thing I would say, and, and something that uh, I think should provide reassurance, is that um, the commercial media that's now available is, is so rigorously tested and quality controlled that really, if you get the setup uh, correct from, from the beginning, we really shouldn't see um, any, any major issues. Of course, whether you decide to change is another matter based on some of the parameters that you look at, but, but really you shouldn't be afraid from the beginning because commercial media is, uh, is certainly very robust um, nowadays. And in those early days, and, and Steve will bear that in, bear, uh, bear me out on this, uh, you know, we used to make our own media in the early days of IVF. And so when commercial media came along, we were uh, readily uh, happy to change uh, and to evaluate it and make sure we could introduce that in a, in a sensible way into our laboratory. And then as things have changed over the years, we've had sequential media coming into favor. Um, and then single step media has taken over a little bit. And then with time lapse and other uh, culture uh, scenarios at the moment, you know, people have changed and been looking more at uh, revising their, their culture protocols over time. But as you might imagine, there are some things that, that make it a little bit troublesome. And, and, and Steve has alluded to, to some of these, particularly the numbers that are involved if you want to run a, a very uh, high powered trial to show something is better than others is, is almost impossible for IVF labs to uh, carry out, although they have been done in the past. Uh, and we can offer support through one of my colleagues, Dave Morrill, um, in um, medical affairs at Cooper Surgical, if people actually want to go down that route. But more importantly, we need to look at what endpoints are going to help us decide. And of course, there's logistical issues as well, whether we can get the media, what the cost might be, et cetera. But really from the very beginning, we need to have careful planning and we need to optimize our, our conditions for both the in-house media that we have and the one that we're evaluating to make sure that the results that we get are sensible uh, and are really going to be able to help us in decide which way we should move forward. So what is the best practice? What physically can we do? What is possible within the lab? What should our endpoints be to help us decide? And really what can be demonstrated in the, in the time frame uh, that we're talking about? And we may not cover all of this in this part and, and uh, our, our speakers may cover more of uh, their feelings on these areas, but uh, we can always cover them a little bit in the Q&A at, at the end. So um, I just want to reiterate something that's, I think, uh, of critical importance when you're going to do um, an evaluation, and that's that not all culture media is the same. And, I, and it may seem obvious, and I, I apologize to the audience if I'm stating the obvious here, uh, but I've been to a number of labs over the last six years when I've been helping laboratories do media evaluations where um, they just get the, the trial media that's coming into the lab and they use it in exactly the same way as their incumbent media. Um, and not always will that be an ideal scenario. It may be that the constituents are, are, are pretty similar between the two, but in most cases it's not. And we really need to set the scene for uh, the, the, uh, the two media that are going to be evaluated and make sure that they're both working optimally. And one of the considerations, of course, is that the bicarbonate concentration in, in commercially available media is different. Um, and therefore the CO2 concentration needed to get the target pH is potentially going to be different. Uh, one of the problems over the years with pH has always been how to measure it accurately. And certainly I've been using a blood gas analyzer in the field for the last six years to help labs, again, as I said before, uh, optimize their conditions at the start. And this gives us a good baseline to determine whether we're in the right range uh, for the media of choice. Uh, 
and therefore it may mean that we need separate incubators what what um is uh, a scenario we shouldn't get into is for example if media a needs a co2 concentration of 5.5 and media b needs 6.5 to give us the target ph we shouldn't just put both in the same incubator at six percent uh, and have a, a halfway house because this will not do uh, service to either uh, arms of the evaluation. Again, we should consider uh, making the dishes and how we equilibrate them because, again, there may be some slight variations between different media. And of course, before we start, we really need to design how we're going to evaluate the outcome uh, to determine uh, whether we're going to make uh, a change from one media to another. Now, uh, I put here that there are three uh, ways of um, evaluating culture media. Of course, there is a there is a fourth path which which some labs take, and they just make a decision to change. Uh, so they don't do a, an evaluation with their current media; they just make a decision to move from one to another on a given day. They set the parameters beforehand, and then and then move. And uh, uh, it's a it's a brave embryologist that does that. And in most cases, people are going to look at a, one of these scenarios. Um, of course, the most robust uh, scientifically is to use sibling oocytes, but that. Um, has some uh, issues, uh, as uh, we will see. Um, you can use match patients or use uh, historical comparisons. But again, whatever you choose, whatever way you choose, you need to give both arms of the trial uh, equal uh, weight and bearing and, and treat them in the same way so that you potentially get the best outcome from, uh, from both uh, media that you're evaluating. And so if we're looking at match patients, which is probably what most people are going to do, and this also relates to KPIs in the laboratory, uh, we should be looking at good prognosis patients because, uh, again, when we're looking at KPIs in the lab, um, we need to use this uh, uh, population that's going to tell us from one period of time to the next whether results are, are, are equal or they're changing over time. And so it, it tries to remove some bias, and I'm sure our... Um, uh, I guess later we'll talk potentially about bias towards uh, one reader or another or bias within an evaluation. So this is just an example. These are just uh, recommendations because these mostly come from uh, the Alpha, uh, sorry, the Vienna consensus that looks at KPIs in the embryology laboratory. And so these are what most labs I think would regard as a, a reasonably good prognosis patient. So we need to use our younger patients. We need to have certain criteria um, using um, either ejaculated, frozen, or fresh sperm, and not uh, surgically retrieved, etc. And you can you can see the list here. But but ideally, this is the patient group we want to evaluate the media based upon. And then when we're going to do our collection of data, what should we be looking at? And so again, a list here that you might want to consider um, as part of the evaluation of the data at the end to make sure that the, the patient groups have been uh, relatively evenly aligned and then there's no bias between one and the other. And as I say, you might expect these uh, age, uh, etiology, et cetera, and then uh, the number of eggs collected and mature eggs, et cetera. So again, these will relate to the KPIs of the laboratory um, and will give you an indication that you're really comparing like with like. And then when we're looking at match patients, how do we uh, determine which ones are going to be uh, involved with which media? So are we going to look at um, alternate patients, alternate days, alternate weeks? And all of these have their, um, their merits. Uh, and again, much will depend on the workload of the lab um, to determine which one is actually practical within the setting um, that we find ourselves. And again, as we mentioned a couple of times, avoiding bias can be difficult. Um, depending on the treatment type that's going through. And again, in the UK, we have a, a split between IVF and ICSI. In other countries, um, we see particularly uh, in the Middle East, for example, there's very little IVF done anymore. So it would be all an ICSI, ICSI population. A type of stimulation can, can have an impact and we should measure the quality of the uh, eggs coming into the lab. And not least, of course, in a practical sense, the, uh, the actual incubator space that we have I mentioned earlier, it may be necessary to have different setups for different media. And again, that might prove problematic, uh, depending on the number and the type of incubators um, that we have. But wherever possible, we should be standardizing the system and optimizing it for the two groups to give um, a, a reasonable chance within a, a relatively small number of cases. And, and in most cases, we're talking 
between 20 to 30 mostly, maybe up to 50, but uh, it's a relatively small number. So we need to get uh, the conditions right to, to be able to see um, that both will work equally as well. Within that time frame and that number, it's unlikely that you will see some significant differences between the two. So ultimately we're, we're actually looking for um, results that are, are similar to the incumbent media that we've been using uh, and generated good results for us. So again, just an example of what we might collect. So the number of fertilized, normally fertilized uh, embryos, uh, the number of three PNs of those that were normally fertilized, how many went on to cleave, uh, the embryo quality uh, on the day of transfer and uh, a parameter that's actually very useful in the embryology setting per se is a utilization rate. So the number of embryos that were available for transfer or for uh, cryopreservation gives us a utilization rate. And if we stretch the evaluation a bit further uh, to look at pregnancy data, but bear in mind, these can take uh, a considerable length of time to get this data through. Um, and you need, to, uh, you need to bear that in mind. So just to finish off, uh, this is really looking at uh, KPIs of the lab anyway. And these are part of the evaluation of the, of the media uh, that we can use as a, as a flowchart to look at um, the, the uh, obviously the normal uh, mature eggs that we get with into the laboratory. So this is generally a reference indicator, not a key performance indicator, but it's important for the lab to know. And then other that are in the Vienna consensus that we might look at damage rates, et cetera, and normal fertilization rate, development rate. And again, in the time uh, that we have now with time lapse, people might want to look at developmental parameters and time frames. Uh, and again, utilization rate at the end. So the number available for transfer and for freezing. And all of these should be uh, mostly within our lab's KPIs anyway. And you can use this sort of data uh, to help you determine um, whether the uh, new media, the, the media being under evaluation is performing as you would expect. So, so I don't want to take up too much time. It's a big subject and we could probably spend all day speaking about this. But just to summarize, um, it's true to say really that no culture media system bears any resemblance to the in vivo situation and they're not fully uh, optimized for human IVF and therefore we need to optimize, a, optimize our systems locally. Uh, studies to date show no clear advantage of any one system over the other, including sequential versus single step media. So all media, if it's optimized, will give us reasonable results. Uh, and so, you know, it should be possible when doing an evaluation to get um, decent results in a fairly short period of time. And as I said, from the very beginning, the, the media that is now commercially available is very robust uh, and shouldn't cause us too many problems. Again, just stressing, we need to optimize the system for that media when we first start. And then, as we've mentioned, trialing a new media, and hopefully our, uh, our next speakers will um, allude to some of these issues, so the practical implications, set what your objectives are, whether it's a research or a trial or just an evaluation, which is going to be the case most of the time. And the evaluation needs to be optimized, including for our incubators for pH, osmolality, how we set up the dishes and that varies depending on different incubators potentially. Uh, we need to understand where the limits are and have other considerations when we're finally making the decision as, uh, as Steve pointed out in the introduction. So that might include uh, the logistics, supply, shelf life, cost, etc. But a robust internal quality control is, is very important to monitor performance on a day-to-day -day basis, but particularly when you're thinking of introducing something new into the labor laboratory. So that's just me, that's just a brief introduction. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen, pass over to uh, Emily to introduce the, the guest speakers and uh, answer any Q&A at the end, if you have any uh, burning questions. Lovely, thank you very much. Thank you to the two Steves there for, for setting the scene. We've had a couple of questions come into the Q&A box already. Please do keep them coming in. And um, we're going to turn now to our panel members to talk through their experiences. We'll go first to Dr. Helen Clark. Helen started training as an embryologist in St. James in Leeds many years ago and joined Jessup Fertility as an embryologist when it opened in 2001. Helen is now one of the senior embryologists and person responsible for the clinic, as well as an associate lecturer with Manchester Metropolitan University and the University of Sheffield. Helen was also laboratory study coordinator for the CHAP study, a multi-centre research study into the effects of occupation and lifestyle on semen quality, and a previous executive member of ACE. 
Helen currently sits on the Embryology Steering Committee for UK NEQAS. Helen, thank you very much for joining us today and telling us about your experiences. I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so as Steve Levitt alluded to the fact that we used to make our own media and, and I think it, it kind of shows how long I've been an embryologist because I was one of those people, but also how long Steve's been in the field because it was him that taught me how to make the media. Um, it, it was pretty stressful. We'd make it on a Friday for the following week. So I'd like to take this opportunity firstly to express my thanks for inviting me to the webinar, but also thank you to Cooper and other companies for making the media for us these days because it, it really reduces our stress, stress levels on a Friday afternoon. Thank you. So first of all, why did we want to change media? It is a, it is a big step or it feels like a big step. And actually, we were very happy with our supplier in terms of the quality of the product, the customer support, the delivery times, all those things that are important. And our results were good. But over the course of a few months, what we found was that we were noticing quite a high proportion of embryos or what we felt was a high proportion of embryos developing vacuoles at various stages of development, but specifically at the stage of compaction. And we know that if an embryo develops vacuoles at this stage, that it is thought to be associated with that embryo then arresting and not making a good blastocyst. So we were quite concerned about it. Although I must say our pregnancy rates weren't affected. It was just what we were seeing as the embryos were developing. So these vacuoles sometimes were quite large. They'd take up the majority of the embryo and sometimes the embryos would seem to recover, sometimes not. But either way, we felt that there was something perhaps not quite right. Uh, we did approach the supplier and they did make some suggestions, such as they gave us quite a lot of advice about making our dishes. They thought perhaps it was to do with the um, evaporation while we were making the dishes and some other suggestions as well, but it didn't help. So at that point, we decided we'd look at some other companies to see if a change was feasible and whether we thought it would be of benefit. Now, we thought that it would probably be quite time consuming process, so there was quite a lot of planning involved and we really wanted to make sure that we were changing to the right media. We didn't have the time or the resources to compare more than more than one media with our existing one. And so and we needed it to be as simple as possible. We wanted the, the, um, the lowest amount of impact on our workload and for everybody to be involved and for it to run as smoothly as possible. So as a, as a step one, and I think this is quite a useful thing to do, we've had a chat with people at other clinics. What's everybody else using? How do they find it? Um, and then we selected the company that we that anecdotally gave good results from these discussions. And so we contacted um, Cooper to have a chat with them about what might be the next step. So our aim, we were happy with pregnancy results, as, as I've said. So really all we wanted to do is check that the new media wouldn't have an adverse effect working with our protocols, but would hopefully reduce the appearance of the vacuoles that we were seeing. We weren't sure whether we would need ethical approval for it. And being in a large teaching hospitals trust has its pros and its cons. Um, some of the cons were that there was an awful lot of paperwork uh, to go along, alongside this media assessment. But one of the pros is that we've got access to a large research department. So we got in touch with them and they assured us that we didn't need ethics approval. It was classed as a service evaluation and they talked us through some of the paperwork that we would need. So we had a chat with the company to find out what the best way to do the evaluation might be. And we did want to do it with minimal disruption to our da daily workload. So the different approaches Steve Levitt's already outlined. So the sibling oocyte model, matching patients or the historical matching of patients. And what we decided to do was to go for option one with the sibling oocytes. Uh, we felt it would be fairly straightforward and actually it was. So we use Embryoscope in our labs and what we did was we made the dishes, so wells one to six had one media in and wells 12, sorry, seven to 12 had the other media in 
And then after the egg collection or after the ICSI, um, we would randomly, and I say randomly, like randomly, because there was, um, it was just done by eye, we'd allocate the um, eggs to one media or the other. We weren't particularly strict with our inclusion criteria of which patients we were going to do this for. Um, in the end, we settled on all patients who had six or more eggs normally fertilized with IVF, or patients who had eight or more eggs injected um, using ICSI. And the idea of this approach was that, first of all, it cuts down on the work of having to um, separate out those patients that, that weren't eligible to be included. But by um, wanting these numbers of eggs or eggs for injection, we felt that that alone helps us to select fairly good prognosis patients on the basis that they've respond, had a reasonable response and they've got a reasonable number of eggs. So in the end, we ran the um, evaluation on 45 patients and that was a total of 532 eggs. So the variables that we looked at, again, what the, the, the variables that Steve uh, outlined in his introduction there, so the percentage of normally fertilized and abnormally fertilized eggs. We also looked at the percentage of total blastocysts that were that developed. Another, another criteria that we used, we tried to pick criteria that were um, less subjective and more objective. And because we use Embryoscope, the Embryoscope gives a score to each embryo um, on day five. So we looked at that Embryoscope score as well. And But the Embryoscope just for the blastocysts that were either embryo uh, that we used for transport, transfer or that were frozen. We looked at utilization rates and clinical pregnancy rates but also we included the appearance of vacuoles. So the number of normally fertilized eggs that develop vacuoles and the time that the first vacuole appeared. So our results, um, very difficult to do meaningful statistics on such low numbers, but we didn't, the, the results that we got were pretty much identical for all of those criteria, uh, all of those variables rather apart from the number of fertilized eggs, which then went on to develop vacuoles. A lot of limitations in the way that we did the study, it wasn't blinded. Uh, we knew exactly which six wells had which media in. It was quite low numbers of patients, but having said that, we have got the option um, as we go forward and collect our routine KPI data to be able to match that with our historical data if we do want to, to delve a bit deeper. Another limitation and perhaps a source of bias is that the same media was always in the first six wells and the same media was always in the last six wells of that embryoscope dish. And if we're always making the dish in the same way, then potentially wells one to six might suffer more evaporation than wells seven to 12. We are fairly quick at making dishes and we're, we're fairly confident that that wasn't the case, but we've got to consider all these different factors. So to, once we'd done the evaluation, we then needed to make the decision of when to bring in the new media and start using it routinely. And actually, this is where one of the, the good things, the very, very few good things about COVID, but um, when we closed, when we had to close back in March of 2020, that was a natural break for us. Um, and then when we reopened in July, we started using the new media at that point. We have tried to have a look at the data comparing um, how we're doing now with how we were doing this time last year, but it's still very early days and also for a lot of the time that we've been reopened, we have been prioritizing lower, um, poorer prognosis patients and older patients. So we are a little bit wary about comparing that data at the moment. And also we're running at a reduced capacity. So the data is quite limited, but the pregnancy rates that we've had so far are encouraging. Uh, we're possibly seeing a slight increase in utilization rates, um, but anecdotally, we, we do feel that we're seeing a lot fewer vacuoles, uh, but embryos with vacuoles developing. 
I asked, I, I thought it would probably be good if it wasn't just me giving the feedback. So I asked my team what they thought about the change in media. And um, this is just some of the comments that they replied with. They said, it's reassuring to know the culture media is used successfully already in other clinics. They said it wasn't as confusing as I was expecting, even with the split embryo scope slides. It was good because it prompted us to update all our SOPs and to rename everything to more generic names, uh, which helped with us um, sort of drilling down into the detail, detail of those SOPs and improving them for future use. What we did for quite a long time after we swapped was that we watched each other label dishes and set up to make sure that we were all doing it right. And we might have gone a little bit overboard with that, but we wanted to be sure we were nailing it. Uh, one of the team feels that phenol red gives good visual reassurance, and that's something that we didn't have previously, but perhaps there are too many products to choose from. In terms of um, the, the good and the bad things, it was quite a long drawn out process for us, but mostly because we are a large trust. And like I said earlier, there's a lot of paperwork that we have to do um, and present studies, uh, um, summaries of the service evaluation, at unit meetings and board meetings. And then there was total tender process as well that had to be a book board, um, but it was worth it. And, and the actual day-to-day -day evaluation was, was definitely the easy bit. So our follow-up plans are, we will we'll review the vacuolation again in a few months time. Our clinical pregnancy rate is stable, but doesn't seem yet to be improved on 2019, might improve overall when the patient demographic isn't quite so biased. And in summary, just it, it was actually very straightforward. Um, I, I feel that we are, as, as, a, as a group of people, quite wary of change a lot of the time. So it was reassuring to have good support from the company. And um, I'm pleased to say that in the end, it was, it was pretty painless. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Helen. Lovely to hear from you there. You're recounting your experiences. There's obviously no right or wrong way to evaluate a culture media. So it's interesting to hear how people have gone uh, about it in, with different perspectives. Um, so we'll now turn to, to Sophie Bird to hear what Sophie's um, done with her experience of evaluating media. Sophie has over 13 years experience in embryology in both the private sector and NHS. She currently works as a lab manager and lead clinical embryologist at Beginnings ACU, which is Epsom and St Helier University Hospitals NHS Trust. After completing her BSc in the Biology of Fertility and Embryo Development at University College London, she went on to complete her MMed Sci in Assisted Reproduction Technology at the University of Nottingham. Sophie has published on the subjects of witnessing and culture media as an, and is a keen advocate of the scientist training program, having trained many embryologists over the years herself. Sophie, I can't see if you could uh, just switch your camera on for us, please. Hello. Oh, lovely. There we are. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'll hand over to you no. to tell us about your experiences. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Emily, and thank you for asking me to talk. So I'm just going to go through the experience we had back in 2013 with the uh, published trial that we did on two culture medias. And being 2013, a lot of other labs were at that time using uh, sequential media, as were we, so doing a day three change. And um, we decided to do the trial really because we could see the future. We could see that one single step was coming um, and we wanted to investigate whether it could be used in our lab to reduce the workload essentially. So um, get rid of completely the day three change over step and um, whether it would have any effect on results, although we weren't really expecting to see any difference. And also just to see if it could reduce the risk of having to move embryos um, on day three, because obviously with the uh, changeovers, you're you're picking up the pipette, uh, embryos in the pipette, so potentially introducing some risk of loss there, loss or damage. So um, we decided to use a sibling zygote trial, and the reason we chose that is we didn't really want to go through all the matching process. So matching the patients, matching the eggs, um, it was just too much of a faff. So 
we essentially said if we can just do split the zygotes after fertilization check into one media or the other then we were getting rid of some of the um, potential pitfalls of like the fertilization method uh, fertilization rates we we just we just thought this was the best way to go about um, actually looking at the embryo development rather than we didn't want to look at the outcomes of fertilization or anything so um, we did have some criteria for inclusion criteria and the patients had to be 38 years or um, years old or below they also had to be gold standard patients so first or second cycle and they had to have six or more 2pn so six or more zygotes to to use for the trial um, in total we had 257 zygotes that were used and we split them between we were in the Quinn's Advantage sequential and um, the global media which is uh, primarily used in the US at the time so we essentially um, looked at the outcomes which we wanted to evaluate and um, we wanted to essentially assure that they, they weren't any different and they were performing well so we looked at the rates of blastocyst development we looked at the quality of the embryo development and we also looked at um, whether we were selecting for transfer or freezing more from one culture uh, media or the other and we also looked at our utilization rates um, for freezing as well. So embryo transfer and freezing. And um, surprise, surprise, we found no difference, which we were quite pleased about. Um, interestingly, we didn't change over to single step um, after the trial. And I believe I, I um, then left that unit uh, shortly after the trial, I believe they did go over to single step but at a later date and it wasn't the same one that we had trialed so um, for the actual trial we used gps dishes and we were not in the embryoscope the, i mean the embryoscope was extremely new then um, we were using the planar benchtop bt37s gps global dishes because um, we could then separate we had kind of one media in well, just like Helen was saying, in the first few wells and then the second media in the second few wells. So what we did attempt is, A, we did a um, staff training session before starting the trial so that we could explain to embryologists how it was going to work. We didn't want to introduce um, performance bias. So we tried to make sure the embryologist that was doing the dish prep was all the same, always the same person, which was really tedious. Um, we also didn't let the embryology practitioners know um, which media was which, so we didn't want them to know which side was what. So if there was an odd number of zygotes, they just automatically went into the right-hand side. But um, thinking back at that, both medias used phenol, which was really handy because it meant we couldn't visually see the difference. Um, and uh, But we did have almost immediately all the embryologists guessing which media was the new one and which media was the 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 old one so it that didn't help we also did a day three changeover with the um, single step so that we were keeping the same protocol basically so um day three change for everyone we didn't want to disadvantage um the sequential by essentially not doing a day three change for the one step um so yes we, we we did have a bit of difficulty with with bias because the embryologists basically knew already even though we were trying to keep that secret um which was which so um it did cut down the workload because it when when they eventually moved to single step because they weren't having to do the day three but like steve was saying the study lacked power um Obviously, we didn't quite reach the 96,000 um, zygotes we needed for the, the amazing power statistic there. Um, so, yes, it, it, it was flawed in many ways. And as a result, um, it's made me a lot more brave about changing culture medias. So at, um, another NHS, large NHS unit I worked at, they had just moved over to um, a single step media by the time I joined and I was very confident using it by then um, and happy that they had made that change and then more recently I swapped media as well um, did not do a trial did 
uh, more evaluation on things that um, Steve was talking about and Emily about things like um, the cost, the ease of use, the reliability of the um, production line, whether it was going to arrive in a good order. The um, did think about the reduction in risk, obviously not having to do that day three change. Um, the way we use things, so like if we were going to do further culture and things like embryoscope, obviously having a single step media is um, much easier for that. And we did look at shelf life, um, but it wasn't a massive factor. And I think in a small clinic, it could be. Um, but interestingly, I, I analyzed KPIs yearly um, for, unless I think there's an issue that needs looking into. And I didn't really feel that there was a huge need to check um, KPIs three months after changing media for the reasons that were said earlier with um, Steve Levitt about the, you know, the reliability of these medias now, these commercial medias, they've come such a long way. It almost feels like unless we're going to be using a media that nobody else has used before, it just seems almost counterproductive to um, do the trial in the first place because we should have uh, trust in these companies that they are making a media of a certain quality. And I guess that's my take home message is um, that the trial, the trial is not always necessary. It's nice to do but it is a lot of work and there are costs and workload implications and I just don't think unless we're using a, a new media that hasn't been used in the UK or has been introduced to the UK that uh, it's really really necessary and certainly one wouldn't constitute what I would consider as, as proper research uh, so I'll pass you back over to Emily on that note. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. On that note, Sophie, what, what would you do next time around when you wanted to assess a, a new media? I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't assess it. <laughs> um, so I'd make sure I was moving over to something that um, had a good... Basically, a lot of other people need to be using it for me to have the confidence just to move over. Um, and it helps if you've had individual, individual experience, experience using that media, that media plan to plan use, to use before as well as well. So it's, I think it's just about having the confidence to move over, move over um, um, and, and, and jump in. Jump in. Mm. So move over and monitor KPIs. Yeah. Great. Thank, thank you for that, Sophie. Um, I'm, I'm saying, I said earlier that there are lots of different ways to evaluate a, a culture media, um, but we've got Stephen Harbottle up next, who actually had a very similar experience for, for, from Helen. Uh, I'll introduce you, Stephen. So Stephen is a consultant embryologist and person responsible at Cambridge IVF, part of Cambridge University Hospitals NHS Trust. Stephen's career in reproductive science began in 1994 at the University of Bristol. He joined the team at Cambridge IVF in 2009 and designed and oversaw the build of the Cambridge IVF facility, which was at the time regarded as a leading example of laboratory design. Stephen is the former chair of both the Association of Clinical Embryologists and the Association of Biomedical Andrologists and is a current executive board member of Alpha Scientists in Reproductive Medicine. Stephen's current research interests include clinical applications of ultra high power microscopy sperm selection, developing strategies to improve the safety and effectiveness of gamete and embryo cryo storage and developing non-invasive care pathways for mildly subfertile men. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us today. So as I was just saying earlier, I had a very similar experience and situation to Helen there. Perhaps you'd uh, like to tell us anything in addition to, to what Helen commented on earlier. That, that, that's right, Emily, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to participate today. It's an honour to do so. I mean, Helen's experience and our experience were, were quite aligned. We were seeing concerns uh, with uh, vacuolation. We were also seeing concerns with incorporation of cells coming out of compaction into blastocyst formation. Um, so day, day four being the primary area of concern. So we reached out to a group of uh, senior scientists and we had conversations, uh, see what everyone else was doing. And what we then thought we needed to do, first of all, was, well, is there anything wrong with our existing culture system? So we went through a revalidation process. And we realized that there was nothing unduly concerning in that regard. So then we started to think, well, what else can we do? And of course, the obvious thing to do was to trial uh, an additional culture media. So how did we do about, go about that? It, it's a long time since we'd, we'd done that. It would be the first time in Cambridge IVF's history that we had done that. So we looked at options and then we reached out to contact 
uh, manufacturers and you know we very quickly gravitated, gravitated to, to Cooper Surgical uh, with regard to the alternative media we wanted to trial. Um, we of course wanted to validate that as Steve Levitt said it's very important to make sure that we're comparing apples with apples and that the new system will thrive in our existing culture system or perhaps change the culture system if we need to. And Steve Levitt himself was very kind enough to, to come into the lab and validate the alternative culture system in our existing um, environment. And, and the good news was that it appeared to be completely comparable, which meant that we could with confidence proceed with um, you know, a, a direct comparison as we'd intended to. So our plan of approach is very similar to Helen's. We also have the embryoscope system. And what we did is exactly what Helen did. We divided the zygotes between the, the two sides of the embryoscope plus dish, left and right, one media in one side, one media in the other side, and divided the um, uh, zygotes evenly and hopefully without bias as much as possible between those two environments. We did that for all IVF and ICSI cycles where we had more than six eggs collected and we modified our SOP to accommodate that shift and made sure that all of our operators were trained and competent in the use of the new media. One media contained phenol red and the other didn't. Um, so as Sophie said, it was pretty obvious which was which, um, but we accepted that as one of the factors that we couldn't control with, with the nature of what we were hoping to do. All of the annotations on the embryoscope system were performed by one competent operator and our primary output, outputs of the study were similar to Helen's blastulation, uh, the relative percentage of blastocyst utilization, i.e. those that were either cryopreserved or used for embryo transfer, the incidence and severity of vacuolation and the relative proportion of cellular incorporation at blastocyst, at blastocyst development, um, and also the day three and day five kid score. Um, simply because the embryoscope allows us to use that. And that is a nice non-subjective way that we can evaluate embryo quality on it, its journey of development rather than just how it looks at any specific moment in time. And we advocate that as a, you know, as a, as a valuable tool when selecting embryos. And we felt it, it offered less risk of bias. So we didn't look at the traditional outputs, so your pregnancy rates, um, et cetera, et cetera. We felt those introduced elements of subjectivity because you bring in another third party intervention who did the transfer from a medic point of view, from a scientist point of view, and we can't control for all of that in this sort of study. And as outputs, we didn't feel they were relevant. So we focused really on what the embryos were doing in the culture media, not what happened to them thereafter, if that makes sense. But the important thing is that we designed this study before we had the conversations with the alternative providers of media. So we knew what we were doing and we could then discuss with them what we intended to do. Emily was good enough in person to visit us in Cambridge to discuss the, the benefits uh, of the media we were considering from Cooper Surgical and also to uh, support us to do the, the study. So from a cost point of view, there was no cost involved in performing the study because Cooper Surgically ki kindly offered to um, provide the media for us to perform the study. And the study expanded to 100 cycles of treatment. Uh, in, we ended up with 103 cycles with more than 700 uh, zygotes by the end of it. We concluded that uh, evaluation at the end of February. We're still crunching the data, so it is very much hot off the press. I don't have anything that I can share today other than we are seeing some, some shifts, some interesting observations in, in the data that would suggest that one media may offer some benefits over the other, but it, it's too early to, to say more than that today. But watch this space because it is something that we do hope to, to publish um, and share with you all. Um, Really, the only thing I'd like to say just in summary is, I think it's very important for labs not to, not to settle, not to rest on your laurels. As Steve said, even when things are going well, that, that perhaps is the optimal time to look at an alternate culture media, not in a reactive way as myself and Helen had to do, um, to stay on top of it, always look for the marginal gains. I mean, we owe it to our patients to do that. Um, and don't be, don't overcomplicate studies. Look for the primary outcomes that are rel relative to what you are trying to achieve. And don't always assume that pregnancy rate or live birth rate is necessarily the right end point for your study. Make sure that you frame it with the objectives and, and the concerns that you're trying to address with the study in itself. 
And also don't be afraid to approach to, uh, companies such as Cooper Surgical because you know the support we've had from them and, and Emily's been engaged all the way through has really made it very straightforward for us to, to, you know, to complete the study and hopefully get valuable information that we can share with the rest of the, the scientific community. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for the kind comments as well. I, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll ask you the same question as, as Sophie. Oh. oh, we've lost him. I think. Oh, is he back? I pressed my leave button too quickly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can't leave yet. We've got questions to do. Um, to go back in time, would you have done anything, if you were to repeat the process now, would you do anything differently or would you even undertake an evaluation? I think I'm, I'm comfortable with what we did. Um, I'm reassured to hear that the approach that we had was very similar to the approach that uh, the unit in, in Sheffield had because that's you know a very well regarded unit as well. So it's nice to see that we were doing things the same way. I would, I would like to perhaps have had more participants in the study and run it for a little bit longer, but you have to be realistic with these things. We can't run these things forever. So I, I don't think there's anything I would do differently other than perhaps going back to what Steve said at the start, maybe looked at uh, you know, alternative culture medias before you know, we, we, we found a need to actually do so and actually keep on top of it in that way. But I'm happy with, with the study as we performed it. Yeah, hindsight, always valuable, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Helen, I'll ask the same question to you. If you were to turn back time, would you would you have done anything differently now? No, I don't think we would. We were quite apprehensive about changing media. It feels like a huge thing to do, especially when things are going well. Our, all our KPIs were absolutely fine. Um, and it was just this this vacuole issue. And actually, if we hadn't a change, probably, you know, it, it, it would have it would have perhaps resolved itself. I, I don't know. It did feel like a big step, but in hindsight, it was actually pretty painless. Like I said, it was it was more from our side of things that we had the most work to do in terms of trust paperwork and and answering queries from from management. So no, I don't think we would do it differently. Okay, thank, thank you for that. We're, we're, we're going to do a few minutes of q and I'm conscious that it's nearly half past one already. We've, we've had a lot to say on this, this topic today. Um, Steve said at the beginning, it is a big topic and it is. So we may even run another, another webinar on this theme at some point. Um, bit of confusion over what is a trial and what is an evaluation? Steve, Steve T, perhaps you could answer this one. Um. Yeah, this is, I think this is a really important point, um, and Helen's touched on this. Um, I'd like to suggest that people have a look at the Health Research Authority website. Um, the Health Research Authority is, a, is an NHS body, although I do, I understand that its powers do also um, uh, cover private sector research. So it's worth everybody taking a look at this. And there are, there are tools on that website that allow you to answer some of these questions. So um, principally, there are three questions that, that help you determine whether um, what you're intending to do is research or whether it is service evaluation. And um, the, the first is whether the participants, participants in the study are randomized to different groups. If the answer to that is yes, then that might constitute research and therefore need all the necessary approvals. If the answer is no, then it's not research. The second question is, does, and I'm reading this directly from the website, does your study protocol demand changing treatment from accepted standards for any of the patients involved? And clearly in a service, in a culture media evaluation, the answer to that is no you are using something which is, um, which is used by many other people is an, ac is an, accepted, uh, an accepted, accepted standard. So the answer to that would be no. And then the third question is, is your study designed to produce generalizable or transferable findings? Um, and I think that means effectively, are you doing a study that you want to tell the whole world about? so that the results of your study will allow um, you know, other people to look at, the, look at your findings and apply them in your own centre. And I think in terms of the evaluations that we've been discussing today, the answer to that is no. 
So if the answer to those three questions, randomization, um, doing something which is effectively accepted standards, and um, you're not going to be publishing these results widely, then the, um, the decision would be that your evaluation would be considered um, service evaluation and not research. And I noticed there was a question that came in from one of the attendees around uh, patient consent uh, to take part in this. If you are doing formal research, then yes, you have to have patient consent. If you're doing service evaluation, my understanding is that you do not need pa patient consent. Um, I'd be interested to hear particularly Helen's uh, view on that because I think this is an important uh, point. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Steve. And that's what we were advised by the university research department that we have ties with, but also the, the hospital uh, research department as well. So I'd agree with that. But it's, but it is worth, it's definitely worth asking the question um, because people do things differently in different centres, for sure. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you for that both. I think Sophie raised a really interesting area of bias. Um, when, when Sophie was, was talking to us about the uh, media evaluation that she'd undertaken. And, and clearly, Sophie, in your particular situation, it was quite uh, tricky to avoid that. But um, Stephen, Helen, was this something that you were able to overcome or did you even find it an issue? Stephen, let's go to you first. I think in our design, what we tried to do was to simplify it as much as possible to rule out any uncontrollable variable. Um, for example, things such as who set up the dishes. It wasn't practical for us to have one operator setting up all of the dishes because a lot of the dish setup happens on a Sunday. And you know, to ask one operator to, to work every Sunday just wouldn't have been practical. So we made sure that everybody was fully aware of the, you know, the, the process of setting up dishes. And the simple fact that we changed one media for another didn't necessitate any changes to the actual setup of the dish itself. You know, one media, the other media, they, they, they both you know, you, the, the process of setting up the dish was exactly the same. So we felt that, although there is that, you know, variable, we didn't feel that it was something would significantly impair our results. The important thing that we wanted to ensure we had consistency was, was in the actual annotation of the data. Because even with embryoscope, as you know, as you see from, from the NEQAS data, there is some variation operator to operate. And by having one highly experienced operator annotate all of the images for the purposes of the study, what we did was rule out any variation in that regard. So we did give it some consideration and we identified the key areas, but we felt the key area was in the annotation of the videography. Thank you. Helen, uh, your thoughts on this one? Uh, similar to Steve, really. And, but what I would add is that um, it's, evaluating your media isn't a robust research study. What we've got to do is weigh up um, the benefits of doing it against the time and the resources that is going to use up. I mean, the fact that we can, we do have the option just to switch media without doing any kind of evaluation first, because we know that the, the media from all the, the major companies are so rigorously tested. That in itself, I think, means that we don't have to be overly concerned about bias unless it's something that's really, really obviously going to bias the results, would be my thoughts. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sophie, any reflections on your experience of bias? Any further thoughts? Yeah, I was just, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So I did talk about performance bias, but I also um, thought that it'd be interesting just to say a quick note on a detection bias and reporting bias. So detection bias would be um, to get over that. You would blind the assessors to the out. Uh, blind the assessors to the outcome so you wouldn't let the person assessing the results know uh, which arm was which and um, reporting bias is often seen um, I think with with inexperienced researchers where they will um, only report selective outcomes so they won't report some things they'll just choose to omit those so it's quite hard to eliminate all the different types of bias. Mm, creeping in at sort of all ends of the process there. Yeah. Um, question here, what criteria are important when choosing a media to evaluate? Uh, Sophie, we'll come, we'll come back to you. What, what criteria did you use? Um, 
so I don't know why we chose global. Um, I'm trying to wrap my brains. It was so long ago. I think it was um, potentially due to the fact that it wasn't well it wasn't well known in the UK at the time. Um, but Mr. Biggers, who was part of the research, had used it quite extensively in America, and had really good outcomes with it and helped the um, with the design of it. So um, he was very confident in that single step. So I think that uh, affected why we used. The, the single step that we did for the for the trial. Thank you, um, Helen. Your thoughts on that one? Well, whichever media we were going to select to uh, assess against our existing one, we knew probably that outcomes were were going to be pretty similar. So instead, we were looking at things like, is it going to be an easy switch? Is it a like-for-like -like switch, which means that it's going to result in less operator error? You know, we're not going to be using the wrong stage media at, in, um, at the wrong time. We wanted it to be one step because we got used to not having to refresh on day three, which we see as a big advantage. We wanted good technical support and advice. We have to take cost into account. That's a huge thing for us, well, for, for everybody, I guess. Um, but also things like bottle size and shelf lives, because it, it's not cheap. So we want to make sure we're not wasting any. We want to make sure that we're getting um, uh, the most out of every single delivery and we're, we're not throwing anything away. And also with Brexit looming, we wanted to make sure that there wasn't going to be an, in, an interruption in supply. We wanted good reassurance. And again, this is true of all the companies, but you know, we, we did want good reassurance that there wasn't going to be that interruption. And also we occasionally we get into situations where we do run out of things because we've not checked properly or something's got gone out of date. So we wanted to be sure that we could get a, a bottle of one step if we'd run out and it would, it would arrive pretty quickly. Um, and, and so far, we've been really happy with everything. Great. Oh, I'm very, very pleased to hear that. Same question to you, Stephen. I, I think Helen has um, pretty much covered everything that I, I would have said. Obviously, we were in a position coming out of the pandemic when we first locked down in the UK when we started. So we needed that assurance that you know supply chain was going to be intact. We'd already discussed the, the media trial by that point. So we had every confidence in, in the ability of, of Cooper Surgical to deliver on that, which gave us the confidence to proceed with it in, in that challenging time. The other key for us, as I said earlier, was having that confidence that the media that we selected would bolt into our existing culture system. And, you know, Steve Levitt um, coming in and validating the, it in our facility gave us that confidence as well so it was it was making sure we had all the pieces of the jigsaw together before we before we started just to give us the confidence that we weren't going to hit any problems during the trial yeah great Sound, sounds pretty sensible i'm afraid we're, we're going to have to leave it there i think we could probably ask many more questions on this subject and, and debate it for much longer and we'll have to come back i think and, and continue with this on on another day but thank you very much to all of our presenters and speakers today, particularly our speakers from clinics. We and our audience really do appreciate you giving up your time during the working day to join us. It's really brought the subject of how to evaluate a culture media in the real world alive to listen to your, your experiences. And I think some quite contrasting views in the end as to, as to what you'd do if you were to do it again. So thank you very much for that. We should have a poll question coming up on our, our, sc our screen. And, and the poll question is to see if our audience's opinion Oh, thank you very much, has changed as to whether they will consider undertaking a, a culture media evaluation. Our next webinar is on Tuesday. So that's that's Tuesday coming up, Tuesday, March 16th at 4.30. It's a genomics webinar on the subject of reducing avoidable miscarriages by using PGT AI 2.0 plus to detect all haploid and triploid embryos to make sure that you've got yourself signed up for that one. Um, to make sure you know about all of our webinars, please sign up for our fortnightly bulletin by sending an email to our customer services team, customerserviceuk at coopersurgical.com. So it just remains for me to say thank you again to, to all of our panellists for joining us today. And, and thank you so much to our audience for joining us today as well. It's been a pleasure to have your company and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Thank you.